Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Drew Lichtenberg, the resident dramaturg at the Shakespeare Theater Company, and welcome to this special edition of Shakespeare Hour Live in celebration of blindness, STC's upcoming immersive sound and light installation. I saw a dress rehearsal of blindness yesterday, and I can promise you, you will not be disappointed. It is truly a unique theatrical experience, and it feels so good to be saying those words after all these months and days uh, indoors. Uh, today, we are discussing the work of Mr. Jose Saramago, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, and his novel upon which this unique piece of theater is based. Before we get started, uh, a few words of thanks. The Shakespeare Hour Live is a component of Shakespeare Everywhere, which is made possible as always by the visionary support of the Beach Street Foundation. And now it is my personal pleasure to introduce our guests. Uh, joining us live from Portugal, uh, Professor Ana Paula Arnaud, the Professor of Contemporary Portuguese Literature at the University of Coimbra. Uh, Ana Paula, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Drew. Hello, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And how, how is Portugal uh, right now? How is uh, Coimbra, I, I assume, where, where you are? No, actually, I am in Porto, and I work in, in Coimbra. Um, but the situation in Portugal is getting much better, and we feel much, much happier now. Thank you very much, Drew. <laughs> well, it's really, it's really good to hear that. And, uh, you know, it seems like things are looking up as well here in America. So it's, it's wonderful to hear that things in Portugal and, and that part of Europe are also looking up. Also joining us is Pilar del Rio, writer, journalist, and president of the Jose Saramago Foundation. Uh, Pilar, are you there? Hola. Que tal? Uh, so I also want to introduce uh, Eliseo Valerio, our translator for today's conversation. Uh, Eliseo, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, Pilar, how are you doing in, in Portugal? And, and where are you in Portugal or somewhere else? Estoy en Portugal. Eh, soy portuguesa por voluntad propia, nací en España, pero ahora ya vivo en Portugal, que es donde está la sede central de la Fundación José Saramago, en Lisboa. And, and how are you doing today, Pilar, uh, in your region of Portugal? Caí, podemos decir que caí de pie. Mm, haber nacido ya adulta y muy adulta es bueno porque desde el primer momento se pueden elegir los mejores amigos. Podemos decir que en Portugal, en el Portugal de José Saramago y en el Portugal de Ana Paula, se está muy bien. Well, uh, let's get on to it then, uh, without any further ado. I I'm really curious to hear from each of you both how you first encountered Mr. José Saramago's work. Uh, in your case, Pilar, did you meet Mr. Saramago before you read his work? Or, or did or did you encounter first the work and then and then the man? Because I understand you had a, a personal connection to to the person. Creo que como muchos muchos y muchas lectoras en el mundo conocí antes al autor y porque conocí al autor luego pude conocer al ser humano al escritor. Yo soy periodista y después de haber leído dos obras de José Saramago publicadas en España, sentí que tenía que venir a Portugal a, a conocer el país que reflejaban esas dos obras. Memorial del Convento, es decir, eh, en Bla, en Baltasar y Bimunda, en inglés, y El año de la muerte de Ricardo Reis. Vine a conocer el país y sentí que era una cortesía agradecerle al autor El, los libros que estaba escribiendo. Entonces, eh, telefoneé al autor para agradecerle, pero vine como lectora y conocí antes al escritor. Después vino muy bien cuando conocí al ser humano, ya le conocía como, como escritor, sabía lo que pensaba y la relación se pudo hacer muy intensa. So you were so moved by reading Mr. Saramago's works that they inspired you to actually travel to Portugal to see uh, quise, quise conocer el país que se reflejaba en esas obras. Quise saber si esos hombres y esas mujeres de memorial de, del convento 
o del año de la muerte de Ricardo Reis eran ciertas. Quise saber si las sombras estaban en los lugares que José Saramago describía. Quise saber si había esas ansias en los seres humanos. Sí, quise saber si la poesía era posible en Portugal. Wow. Y, descubrí, y descubrí algo mejor. ¿Era cierto lo que José Saramago escribía? Pero descubrí otros colores que José Saramago había tenido que dejar fuera porque no cabían en el libro y sobre todo descubrí que el autor que había escrito esos libros era un ser humano excepcional que nos dignificaba a los seres humanos que éramos sus contemporáneos. Me sentí mejor por compartir el tiempo con un ser humano mmm, tan entero, tan decidido mmm, y tan honesto. Interesting. And, and uh, there's a mention of the shadows. I'm, I'm curious, Ana Paula, how you first encountered Mr. Saramago's work and how you would contextualize his relationship, the relationship of his work to Portuguese society in the 20th century and also more broadly in relation to Portuguese literature and letters in the 20th and indeed in the 21st century. I first encountered the work of Jesse Magu in 1982. So I first met the work and then the, the man. And 1982 was the, the year when he published the novel Memorial do Convento in English, Baltazar and Limunda. I was at the time a first year student at the Faculty of Humanities in, uh, in Coimbra. And when I read the novel, I was completely seduced not only by his style, which, is, which was very, very different from what uh, we used to have in Portuguese literature, in traditional Portuguese literature. And I was also seduced by his enormous sensitivity to capture the character's feelings. Um, concerning the man, uh, I can't remember exactly when I first met him, I think I was a secondary school professor. I was still a secondary school professor, maybe in the early 90s. And I was organizing meetings with writers. And I simply decided to call him and invite him to go to the school where I was teaching. And he accepted. No costs attached. No financial costs attached. So he, he was really, really a very generous person. Um, you know, it concerns the contextualization and the importance of Saramago's work in, uh, in Portugal. I think that um, to me personally and to all readers in general, and among other very important issues, José Saramago's work teaches us to be suspicious of the official versions of history. Baltazar and Blimunda is one example. Uh, the, siege, the history of the siege of Lisbon is another one, the gospel according to Jesus Christ, another one, or again, Cain, which is a very, very interesting uh, novel. So this is one of the most important things for me, and I think for all readers in general, of the work of, of José, uh, José Saramago. And um, José Saramago is also very, very important because he is responsible for for practicing and illustrating the postmodernism in, um, in Portugal. He's one of the exponents of this uh, literary movement in, um, in Portugal. So, I don't so, know if I answered your question. No, 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 brilliantly well, yeah. I mean, in terms of content, right, the, the relationship to official history or historiography, and in terms of form, he, he's such an innovative stylist. Uh, that he, he sort of is the primary uh, example of literary postmodernism. I think that's, and, and I think that's what maybe Pilar was referring to when she talked about the shadows uh, in Portugal, uh, as well as being so inspired by his work that she traveled to Portugal to see the work and indeed uh, meet the man. Uh, I'm interested in the fact that I discovered while working on this production that Mr. Saramago's birth name was in fact, Jose Marinha de Sousa. And Saramago is the Portuguese word for wild radish, I believe, which was scribbled on his birth certificate by someone, we don't know who, some kind of government 
clerk or official. Uh, Pilar, do you think there's a larger significance to the fact that Mr. Saramago adopted this name as a pseudonym? Es que Saramago no lo adoptó como seudónimo. Le llegó impuesto como nombre. Eh, Saramago, esa planta silvestre, eh, era el apodo de la familia. Es una planta muy humilde que nace en, al, en algunos lugares en, las, eh, en el campo y la familia de Saramago era conocida por ese apodo, los Saramago. Pero el nombre real era Sousa. Sousa es un apellido muy frecuente en Portugal. Entonces, cuando fue el padre a inscribir al hijo, parece que el funcionario estaba un poco bebido, estaba un poquito borracho. Entonces, en vez de colocar el nombre José de Sousa, colocó José de Sousa Saramago, que es el apellido que manda. De tal manera que Saramago es nombre real, empieza en José Saramago, hijo, y luego el padre tuvo que asumir el, el nombre del hijo para que el hijo no fuera considerado un hijo natural. El padre tuvo que hacer una declaración diciendo, yo, José de Sousa, también llamado José de Sousa Sar Saramago, es decir, una complicación. Es nombre legal atribuido solamente a un exceso etílico de, de un funcionario de la administración civil. So maybe more of a more of a comedy of errors, Ana Paula, than it is a, a kind of example of governmental corruption. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But um, if we think um, the nickname really suits uh, José Souza, because symbolically, and we have to bear in mind that José Saramago was a man for the people who fought for the people's rights. But this has everything to do with what he has done in his works and what he was as a person. So um, Saramago is a wild plant. Saramago is uh, that wild plant that we find in the people's lands. And Saramago was a man from the people. So symbolically, I think it pleased him, it, it pleased him very much. And there's and a- He really uh, needed to be known, to have been known as uh, José Saramago, not José Melhín, which sounds more like a football player name or something. So he was proud to be known as a wild I plant. Think so. a, I think so. It suits him very well. Yeah, fascinating. Um, another thing that I thought was very interesting and that's kind of difficult to ignore is the fact that Mr. Saramago was only three years old when Salazar overthrew the government and installed a dictatorship that lasted for almost 50 years, 48 years. Uh, and in fact, Mr. Saramago, as you were saying, on Apollo, he becomes famous in the late 70s and early 80s as a novelist after the fall of the Salazar regime in 1974. So how would you say that his life and work are intertwined with this uh, history, this 20th century history of Portugal? How, and how did he relate to these given circumstances? I wonder, Pilar, if we could get your perspective first. I una entrevista de José Saramago que en la fundación tenemos eh, puesta eh, en exhibición en una exposición permanente que dice poder escribir por fin claramente. Eh, durante la dictadura los portugueses no pudieron expresarse como querían ni lo que querían. Tenían que inventar subterfugios literarios. Entonces, eh, era un tiempo triste, era un tiempo negro, era tiempo de fascismo. El fascismo eh, había eh, tenido su época en Europa, había perdido la guerra, pero en Portugal y en España se mantuvieron. Dos regímenes fascistas, Portugal y España. En el fascismo no se puede pensar. Y por supuesto no se puede escribir. Entonces, claro que le afectó muchísimo. Eh, Saramago vivió tiempos de silencio y lo que escribió, y escribió algunas cosas, er, eran con doble sentido, utilizando metáforas, utilizando subterfugios. Finalmente, 
cuando se hizo la revolución del 25 de abril y se instauró la democracia, que es un sistema de dignidad, Saramago pudo escribir claramente y ahí escribió su obra. Su obra llega tarde porque la vida en la dictadura para José Saramago no fue vida. Tampoco fue vida para José Saramago. Yeah, I'm wondering, Ana Paula, if you have any further thoughts on the relationship between Yeah, Zipo yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, Saramago was very much concerned with denouncing all systems of oppressions because he lived in one. And he started publishing in uh, 1947 when uh, um, the Estado Novo, so fascism in Portugal, was uh, on its peak, um, I think. So um, all these novels, uh, maybe except for the first one, The Land of Sin, which was published in 1947, um, all of these novels are very much concerned with exposing themes like uh, oppression, totalitarianism, and therefore very much concerned in defending the weakest and the most oppressed Uh, Saramago, as uh, I have already said, and Pilar has already said, was born in a very poor family, and therefore he had the, a first-hand experience of these social inequalities that in different times and spaces appear in, uh, in, in his books. Now, Blindness is a really interesting Uh, novel from Mr. Saramago's career because it was written relatively late in 1995. Uh, and after Mr. Saramago had, I believe, left Portugal and taken up residence in exile in the Canary Islands in Spain. Uh, and he would win the Nobel Prize a few years later in 1998, I believe one year after Blindness was translated into English. So how do you think Blindness relates to the rest of Mr. Saramago's canon of literary works and these thematic preoccupations, this concern with the oppressed, with the underprivileged, mm -hmm. uh, and what makes it dissimilar as well to his previous works that perhaps allows for this even wider international recognition. Uh, Pilar, I wonder if you have thoughts on blindness in Mr. Saramago's work. Creo que todos los libros son diferentes siempre unos de otros. Eh, José Saramago abordó la tarea de escribir eh, Blindness después de haber escrito un libro que se llama Evangelio según Jesucristo. En ese libro, Evangelio según Jesucristo, Saramago se enfrenta a, a hechos fundamentales de nuestra civilización. Por poner un ejemplo, si Jesucristo no es Dios, la civilización cristiana en la que nosotros vivimos y vivimos en estos momentos, en el año 2021, está basada en una mentira. Si Jesucristo no es Dios, nuestra civilización está basada en una mentira. ¿Cuál es la relación que tenemos los seres humanos con lo humano y con lo divino? Saramago reflexiona en ese libro y entra a fondo en el misterio. Después del Evangelio según Jesucristo, Saramago debió de sentir un vacío enorme. Durante varios años anduvo bien sin saber cómo abordar la escritura, cómo seguir. Y de pronto, un día, estando él solo en un restaurante, pensó, ¿y si estuviéramos ciegos los seres humanos?, ¿Y si viendo no viéramos? De alguna manera esta ceguera que nos atribuye o que se atribuye a él como ser humano procede del hecho de haber escrito antes el Evangelio según Jesucristo. Es decir, tocar temas fundamentales para los seres humanos que somos. ¿Quiénes somos? ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Qué estamos haciendo? cómo dominamos nuestro tiempo, cómo podemos ser hegemónicos y ser mejores, hasta dónde estamos llegando. Son grandes preguntas que plantea el novelista, porque tal vez el novelista, como él decía muchas veces, no sabía escribir ensayos. 
no escribía ensayos, escribía romances, escribía novelas. Es, eh, les digo que no fue fácil para José Saramago enfrentar estos dos asuntos. La relación de los seres humanos con el factor Dios, la relación de los seres humanos con sus semejantes. Vemos a los otros, vemos nuestro planeta, quiénes somos. ¿Somos ciegos o somos...? Sí vemos, pero entonces somos malos. So, in other words, it, it touches, touches on philosophical, deep philosophical and political questions. Uh, Ana Paula, I'm curious to hear how you respond to this question. Well, Blindness is the, the first uh, novel of the second cycle of the literary production of José Saramago, the so-called universalizing cycle. Um, in, in this cycle, the, the author moves from what he calls the statue phase to the stone phase. He says that in an essay which was published in uh, 2013 by the foundation, but it was actually a uh, result of an intervention he made in 1998 in Turin, I think. Um, according to what you read in uh, The Statue and the Stone, the essay I'm referring to, with blindness, Saramago will no longer be interested in contemplating the exterior of the statue, but uh, he will try to understand the interior of it, or as he puts it, he will try to know the stone from which it is made, and therefore he will begin his search for the answer to one of the most complex questions of humanity. And the question is, what the hell are we? His words. In order to answer the question, what the hell are we? Saramago creates an undefined universe without time or special boundaries, in which, with the exception of one, and not by chance a woman, all characters who are never named by a proper name go blind. It is not, however, a question of putting on the scene physical blindness, but on the contrary, the blindness of the spirit the blindness of, a, of the spirit of a world, of a society, in which man definitely becomes a wolf of man. And about this, let me quote Saramago, when it comes to reason, we are blind. We do not rationally use reason. It's like I'm saying we're blind to reason. This evidence, as he um, goes on writing, this evidence is what led me metaphorically to imagine a kind of blindness which deep down exists. I'm going to create a world of the blind because we actually live in a world of the blind. We're all blind, blind of reason. Reason does not behave rationally, which is a form of blindness. So with this novel, Serema continues to address the themes that mark his fiction. Uh, as I've already said, several forms of oppression, the denunciation of several forms of power and the consequent defense of the oppressed. He also denounces the, viol the violation of human rights among many other ideological th uh, themes. But with this novel, he shifts he shifts, as I've already uh, suggested, to a universal register. That is, the novel that belong to the first cycle are directly or indirectly rooted in the Portuguese uh, society, Portuguese reality, or Iberian, in the case of the Stone Raft, published in 1986. In this novel, uh, which is, as I said, the first novel of the second cycle, the author um, no longer roots the, ac the action in a precise, special, or temporal framework. Sometimes he does not give names to the two characters, and he also, in um, structural, formal terms, he also re-simplifies the Baroque 
language, the Baroque structure of the books that he published previously. So to, to a certain extent, blindness is for, a, for the reader much, uh, much less difficult to read than the novels of the first cycle because it is less complex in structure. But it is, uh, I'm sure, much, much more powerful than um, other, other of his novels. Maybe, uh, probably with the year of the death of Ricard Reis, it is one of the most powerful novels of uh, José Salmagre. Well, and I think, I think uh, this helps me understand why experiencing blindness in the theater affected me so profoundly and so deeply, uh, as well as reading the novel, it seems to apply with uncanny precision to the lockdown that we have all been mm -hmm. experiencing over the last year. Uh, it, seems, it seems as if in some ways the novel is actually predicting a kind of epidemic or pandemic or plague. Uh, and the blindness functions in this way as a metaphor that resonates in a truly uncanny way with mm -hmm. what we are all experiencing right now. Uh, I'm wondering, Pilar, if, if you have thought of blindness in relation to this pandemic that we've all been going through now. And also, maybe you can answer, and I realize this was not in the questions that I sent you, the, the cathartic effect of blindness, the cleansing and even hopeful effect of blindness that arises, that arose for me at the end of experiencing the work in the theater, because it, it seems like Saramago, Mr. Saramago exposes us to the irrationality of existence. And then our eyesight comes back and we're able to see how defenseless we all are as, and how dependent we all are upon one another. Do you, do you think that that's naive of me to be projecting a kind of hopeful interpretation onto this play? Because I found it deeply affirming of, of life and society and our existence while also exposing all of these illusions that we rely upon. El libro, Blindness, termina con que la protagonista femenina, la mujer del médico, eh, mira desde una ventana y de repente lo ve todo un poco nublado y piensa, me estoy quedando ciega. Pero de pronto descubre que no, que ella no se está quedando ciega, es que simplemente está oscureciendo. Entonces, y termina exactamente el libro, la ciudad allí estaba. La ciudad es el mundo y continuaba allí. Eh, ¿Eso es un mensaje de esperanza? Yo creo que sí. Saramago terminó diciendo, el mundo está y la ciudad está. Ahora se trata que nosotros queramos ver o decidamos ser ciegos. Nosotros podemos querer ser ciegos. Nos puede convenir ser ciegos, pero también podremos ver y seremos más inteligentes, más altos, seremos hasta más guapos si vemos. Eh, después de ensayos sobre la ceguera, después de Blaines, Saramago escribió ensayos sobre la lucidez. Saramago, para sí mismo y para sus contemporáneos, no quería un futuro negro y oscuro. Decía que con la inteligencia, con la conciencia y con la ética, ética, conciencia, razón, el mundo puede ser muchísimo mejor. Pero tenemos que utilizar los atributos que nos distinguen a los humanos de otros seres vivos, que es que tenemos capacidad de razonar y que tenemos conciencia para la ética. Si utilizamos la conciencia y la ética, seguramente la ciudad seguirá estando y no seremos ciegos. Si decidimos olvidar los principios que nos mantienen y nos definen como seres humanos y queremos ser estadística, simplemente estadística, o consumidores, pues entonces eh, el futuro podrá sí ser muy malo. Para muchos, ¿eh? Algunos se salvarán, pero la mayoría tendrán un futuro oscuro. 
Yeah. Um, reminds me a little bit of Ibsen's Peregint with the, the troll kingdom where you remove a, a speck from your eye. And there are many trolls among us who go around with, with a piece of their eye uh, missing. It seems like a very resonant image. Uh, Ana Paula mentioned the fact that there is a female narrator in blindness, who I believe is the, the wife of an eye doctor, ironically. Um, and this is not an accidental choice. I'm wondering, Pilar, if you have anything to say about the, the gendered nature of the critique that Saramago, Mr. Saramago is making about society, that it's, it's there's something about masculinity and testosterone and male narcissism is connected to blindness as well. In todos los libros de José Saramago, los personajes fuertes son las mujeres. Eh, la capacidad eh, de las mujeres ha sido observar. No han tenido eh, protagonismo, así lo decidió eh, la norma patriarcal. Las mujeres tendrían que tener un puesto secundario. Entonces, el poder de observación a lo largo de la historia, poder de observación ha estado en las mujeres. Y José Saramago lo utiliza así en sus libros, en Levantado y Shaun, en Baltasar y Blimunda, y por supuesto en, en Blaines. ¿Por qué? Porque las mujeres no son las inventoras de la industria de la guerra, no son las inventoras del colonialismo, han tenido un poder de acogida y de observación. Y para Saramago ese poder era también un poder de futuro. Y los personajes femeninos de José Saramago se distinguen sobre los personajes masculinos, siendo que los personajes masculinos también son buenos personajes, ¿eh? no nos olvidemos, son, son gente sencilla y gente buena, pero quien convoca congrega y va más allá en las distintas obras de José Saramago son las mujeres. So women have the power of sight in, in a sense. Uh, and clearly we have two brilliantly clear-sighted, uh, amazing, strong women joining us today. Um, thank you for your time. I, I have two more questions for each of you, although we've gotten so much amazing insight into the works uh, of Mr. Saramago. Um, First, Mr. Saramago died, of course, in 2010, after a very long and distinguished career. I'm wondering, Ana Paula, how you would characterize his continued influence and importance in 21st century society and literature, and also Pilar, um, how you would, how, how you remember him now, or how your understanding of his work continues to change. I wonder, Ana Paula, if we could start with you. Yeah, to start with, um, we all have to recognize uh, uh, Saramago's merit uh, of having contributed to the establishment and consolidation of postmodernism in Portugal, as I've already uh, um, said. Furthermore, and above all, on the one hand, it has to be recognized the merit of having provided the other side of our national history, of Portuguese national history, by rendering justice to all those who have been forgotten in the official versions of our, our past. Um, on the other hand, his novels draw attention to social inequalities and to the need to fight for a freer, a fairer, and a more fraternal world. These are, for me, the biggest merits of the, um, the fiction of, uh, of José Saramago. We, if we read the novel of this author, we won't be the same person at the end of, of the reading of the novel. And this happens with, with blindness, this happens with all of his novels, because he exposes the most complex feelings of the human be being and also his most complex fears. Uh, most or some people do not enjoy the work of José Saramago because they say it is too difficult to read. Well, maybe that's true, but I'm sure it is worthwhile reading it. 
it's really all we can ask for from any work of art, isn't it? That it yes. fundamentally changes us by experiencing it. Uh, Pilar, I wonder, uh, yeah, I wonder how you, how you think of, obviously you have a personal connection to the man, but how you think of his life and work. Mi opinión sería la de una lectora de España que leyó a un autor de Portugal y lo encontró realmente sublime. Pero al fin y al cabo, mi opinión no deja de ser la de una lectora anónima. Tal vez podamos buscar eh, qué han dicho grandes lectores, como por ejemplo Bloom. ¿Qué dijo Bloom cuando se deparó con la obra de José Saramago? Y realmente... Eh, consideró que José Saramago era uno de los grandes escritores del siglo XX, que estaba reflejando las sombras y las luces de este nuestro tiempo y que no había optado por el camino fácil. Había ido con un estilo literario propio, estilo literario propio, a indagar en, en quiénes somos, por qué estamos siendo así, y por qué hemos llegado a este momento de nuestra vida. Son las grandes preguntas que se, que se han hecho a lo largo de la historia, pero hechas desde este momento contemporáneo, hechas o sea, en este momento tecnológico, de gran tecnología y de, en este momento de expansión planetaria. En, y en este tiempo de intuición, porque Saramago en Blindness, de alguna manera lo intuye, de pandemia global. En un momento de pandemia global. Entonces, ¿quiénes somos? ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Qué estamos haciendo aquí? Sin duda alguna, son grandes cuestiones que Saramago se plantea, pero se las plantea literariamente, con un estilo mmm, propio, brillante, y que de alguna manera a quienes nos acercamos a sus libros nos hace, nos hace también más grandes y nos hace más brillantes. Es un estilo um, que nos hace crecer a los lectores. A mí me lo hizo, y hablo desde mi posición de lectora, pero insisto, para situar a José Saramago en el mundo, prefiero que sea Harold Bloom quien lo sitúe. Bueno. Yeah, not a bad, not a bad one. Uh, one of the great authors of the 20th century. Absolutely. Um, final question. Have either of you experienced this specific theatrical adaptation, uh, this socially distanced sight and sound installation, although it's really a piece of theater by Simon Stevens. And did anything strike you about the experience? Did anything about uh, your understanding of blindness change or shift? Pilar, I wonder if, if, if you've seen it. Well, are you making a great face like, no, I haven't seen it. <laughs> eh, ocurrió que efectivamente iba a ir a Londres a verla, pero la pandemia impidió que pudiéramos viajar. Estamos en una situación de pandemia universal y eso nos ha afectado muchísimo al mundo de la cultura. Afortunadamente esta obra está circulando y, y nos va a ayudar a saber que somos seres racionales y seres de cultura, pero no la he visto todavía, no la he visto. Ana, Ana Paula, is, a, is the same true for you as well? Yes, unfortunately, um, I haven't had the chance to see this theat theatrical adaptation, but if you allow me, I would like to, to share you um, another impression I got from seeing a Portuguese adaptation from 2004, Please do, yeah. And also the documentary about this adaptation, uh, the documentary is uh, from uh, 2003, the doc documentary about uh, the preparation of, of the play. Um, the adaptation, the Portuguese adaptation was by uh, Rui Simões and uh, it was for the group, uh, the group Ubando. And um, watching this, um, the documentary and, and the play, uh, but mainly the documentary, I got to know how distressful it was for the actors to embody the characters and their feelings on stage. This documentary shows the remarkable uh, yet painful process of learning blindness. Um, the actors were put on the space of uh, an old deactivated hospital 
which redoubled the, the space of the um, asylum of the novel. And these actors involved in, the, in this project experience were blindfolded during an entire day. And the effects and the sensations arising from the, the, the lack of vision were really, really distressful. And through their brief uh, but enlightening commands, um, I got to know the way they created a kind of sensory memory on stage there was allowed, that allowed them to redouble the various fears and disorientations. And I also got to know um, the affections experienced by the characters on the novel. So I don't know if uh, whenever I watch the, um, the, the other theatrical adaptations, if I'm going to feel the same thing or, or not, but I guess the actors, um, when preparing for, for the play, must have felt all these distressful feelings, all these fears, and at the same time, very, very strong, effective um, feelings. I don't know, maybe you could let me know something about this. <laughs> no, yeah, I think that, um, well, in this version, the, the performance, it's, uh, it's narrated by an actress, Juliette Stevenson, and it's a very similar emotional gamut of experiences that you run from these intensely intimate, uncomfortable, emotional, overwhelming moments to a kind of relief or gratitude at having gone through such a intimate and intense experience. So yeah, I, I think that that resonates very strongly on Apollo with my experience of, of the work. And you know, one of the things that's maybe a, a blessing in disguise is that with the global pandemic. And unfortunately, Pilar, you were unable to see the show in London, but it feels like blindness, like many classical works, keeps on coming back into relevance because it asks such deep and searching questions about, to use Mr. Saramago's terms, what the hell are we? Um, and this moment seems, it seems like blindness is having, uh, it's really one of the first works of theater to be reintroduced to the Western world uh, in the wake of the pandemic or late pandemic or peak pandemic or whatever stage we are in currently. And uh, obviously that's a mixed blessing, but it feels like to me at least, this is, this is the right type of work that's asking the right questions, that's searching for meaning in meaninglessness or in blindness or in sight. Um, so hopefully, Pilar, it can come back. You will be able to see it and experience it when it comes back around your way. Um, and I, I wanna thank you both so much for joining us. This has been a true privilege and a pleasure. I'm humbled to be able to interview you. I also wanna thank, I believe our friends at the Portuguese Embassy for helping coordinate this interview. And I hope that all of you watching at home will join us for at the Shakespeare Theatre Company at the Sydney Harmon Hall for this extraordinary production of Blindness, a unique socially distant sound and sight installation, which is showing now. And tickets are selling, the, the run has sold out so that we've extended, I believe by three weeks uh, into June. So it's, it's the hottest ticket in Washington DC, if you can believe it. So thank you again. Thank you, be safe. Gracias, Pilar. Hasta pronto. Gracias, gracias. Hasta pronto. Gracias Hasta por luego. la traducción. Sí, sí, fue un placer. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you again to Pilar and Ana Paula and Eliseo for translating. Uh, wonderful guests. And please, everyone, come see Blindness at the Sydney Harmon Hall at the Shakespeare Theatre Company. It is running currently through June 13th, although who knows? It may be so popular that we continue to extend. So as always, I am Dr. Drew Lichtenberg, signing off. Mm -hmm.